Hey, Mark, great to be here. And thank you for inviting me on the show. It's great. Um, my background, I've been in this fast paced world of computer technology for 20, 30 years. And early in my career was developing software for e-commerce on the internet. And the past 20 years have been in the field of 3D visualization and computer graphics. And one of my proud achievements is really helping to democratize 3D visualization for automotive and industrial designers, giving them the tools and capability to go from a 3D CAD model to photographic renderings in a matter of minutes. Something you could probably appreciate back in your days of Power Animator and Maya and those tools. And, and so we help to make that process much simpler for rendering. Um, most recently, I'm with Cavernous, and we are developing a platform for creating metaverse destinations. So when we think these metaverse conversations I'm having, I'm having lots of them and looking at them from lots of different ways. And what Cavernous has done is, is thinking, of, I think about it as the real estate of the metaverse, like the buildings, the places, the destinations, the, you've shown me like some showrooms you've developed, you know, mm. where you can go and buy cars and things like this. And I remember, gosh, 20 years ago when the internet, you know, internet marketplaces were going to be, um, the whole thing, that's how we were going to buy. We're going to go to these 3D malls. And then I saw tons of that, but none of that really happened. We didn't have broadband. We, it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is today. We're now on the cusp of that happening. And I'm curious, are, how far along that cusp are we? Is it, is it right here? Or is it still a couple of years out? So I'd like to answer that question, but before, can we put a little context around what is the metaverse? Because everybody's got a different definition. I would love to hear yours. Can we, can we do that for some fun here? Can we say it's not this? It's okay. not a VR You were ready headset. for that question, were you? <laughs> I was ready because everybody thinks putting a VR headset, no. that's the metaverse. That's an no. entry point into the metaverse. Yeah. But so is mobile devices. So are your desktop, your PC. I like to think about holographic displays, something like the Minority Report. If you remember Tom Cruise, of course. where you're moving around, you're waving your hands, you're interacting. You don't have a screen on your head. Right. I'd like to think about those things. And when I think about the metaverse, I think about the progression of the internet because the metaverse is that progression of yeah. the internet. I think about the beginning of the internet, which like I was involved in building technology and software on where the web was very static, very flat, siloed pages of text. Fast forward to the future, to today, the web and the internet is much more dynamic. It's media, it's user-generated content. The metaverse is just the next level of this where it's gonna be this rich immersive visual interface into the internet. And there are gonna be two different types of experiences you get in the metaverse. One is more of the digital simulation of the real world or even a synthetic world. It doesn't have to be a real world. Like we call that virtual reality, think of a video game. The other way to enter the metaverse is going to be a physical overlay on the, a digital overlay on the physical world, which we call augmented reality. And we think about Pokemon Go as an example of that. So that's sort of like the construct, construction of the metaverse. It's this persistent co-present world with others that you can access from all these different entry points as well as in these different ways. So, the way um, Stevenson described it in Snow Crash was you were just, you were in this environment. You weren't wearing a headset. But if we look at like Ready Player One or we read Ready Player Two, they still have these, in fact, they're seats that they, they kind of sit and it, that term jacked in comes up, right? You know, so it's like my, my physical body is, is stuck in space but I'm in this other world. I don't think that's quite what Stevenson was talking about. He was talking about this fully immersive. So you're not, so I, this is where I'm wondering, is this still another 10 or 20 years out because of display technology? And how do I look around and see those things if I'm not wearing goggles? Yes, so I do wanna just make 
a note around Ready Player One and Ready Player Two. To me, that's a very dystopian view of the metaverse. <laughs> and we all know this. I mean, does human society use the metaverse as the escape to enjoy their lives? That, that would be very sad. Um, I think of the metaverse as this augmentation of our existing lives. The real world is great. It's amazing. And we hope that that continues forever, that we're not living in a little box. Um, and, but, the, but the metaverse is this extension of that. But to really make the metaverse happen at scale with all the amazing experiences that we want to see, there is a level of compute that's needed to, to hit yeah. that. And yeah. I read something the other day that Intel said that to get to the most rich, immersive metaverse experience, we need about a thousand times more compute than we have today, which is a lot. Oh, at, a, at, a, at a minimum. At a minimum. Um, so, so we're a ways away from the, the, a very, very detailed metaverse experience, but we're not, today, you can experience the metaverse in many ways that in, the, in a virtual way that has plenty of great experiences. It may not be this ultimate full physics, full simulation, but I think we're there today and I think it's just going to accelerate over time and it's just going to get better and better. And it's a paradigm shift. Ultimately, the metaverse is going to touch every part of our lives. It's a paradigm shift. And it's one of those things when you look back, it just felt like it was always there. Right. It's kind of like right. the smartphone. <laughs> I look back, it was always there. Without the smartphone, it would be, you know, how would we yeah. work? The same thing with the metaverse. Sure. It's uh, my, my grandkids are digital natives. We're digital immigrants i'm i'm thinking of we we got a mirror for um it's great what great branding calls something a mirror and it is a mirror that is from lululemon that has you know my trainer is right there i can see the other three thousand people that are taking the class it's measuring you know my heart rate it knows what i'm doing I, it feels very immersive and yet i don't have anything well i'm wearing this but i i'm fully free in this world it's it's on the road to yes. that it is on the road. I want to ask about what we wrote about in on the show notes was um, this idea of accessibility. And I know that there have been great pains taken for for the blind and for deaf, uh, for people who are um, who can't talk. There's there's lots of accessibility challenges. I'm curious um, what your thoughts are on that, because you, you wrote that you, you have a point of view. Yes thinking about that but when i think about accessibility it's really an overriding umbrella around accessibility to the metaverse it certainly you think about um the people with disabilities but it's also people with low income yeah. to get into the metaverse it needs to be as simple as getting into the web where the web anybody can enter from any device with any kind of network capability and any income level, right? Everybody can get access to the web and the metaverse really isn't there by any means yet. In order for us to make the metaverse truly accessible, we've got a couple problems to solve. One is more compute and making that more ubiquitous, but that's also expensive. But the other thing is just making the ability to get access to better high network bandwidth because in order to have a metaverse experience it could be streamed from a computer in the cloud so it's either you have to have compute or you have to have some network bandwidth ability to experience this to make it accessible that's like the starting point and then there's once it's available to you what is that experience depending on what your abilities are as a human um, and that's another discussion so um, Stevenson uh, writes that um, he, he talks about our hero who is named hero um, yes. seeing, uh, you know, Pizza kind of guy. very low, <laughs> low resolution characters and very high resolution. And he knew somewhere coming in from these public terminals, like in libraries and somewhere coming in from very fancy computers to, to your point. It, it makes me think of 20 years ago when we, you know, we didn't have ubiquitous 
broadband, we had dial up. So even access to web 1.0, 2.0, we're talking about 5.0, 6.0 mm -hmm. in my mind. So let me, let me switch a little bit and, and ask. So Second Life, which was an online environment that was, you know, we could get into this thing, we could learn, we could go to school, we could, we could shop, we could do all of these things. Um, what happened to Second Life? Why didn't that turn into the promise that they had made that this was going to change how we used computers? So, and Second Life is still around. It's having its third life and fourth life. <laughs> Matter of fact, I just read that the founder of Meta, of uh, Second Life, Phil Rosedale, is yeah. now back there. So they're really continuing to move forward because they were sort of this early metaverse. But, right. but why didn't that happen? I think in general, 3D technology is much more complicated and much more intimidating <laughs> than a web page. And you, only a little bit, a little Anthony. bit, just navigating WASD, W-A-S-D. And we watch a lot of newcomers into the 3D world trying to navigate. But there's so many parts of the system that need to get simpler and easier to really make it pervasive and accessible. Yeah. And I think Second Life was sort of gimmicky in the beginning with the avatars and the, the world's. But everybody, you know, people in the 3D world were really excited about it, but that was it. It never really broke through that sort of 3D geekiness, which I think now that the metaverse is starting to become a thing, it's got, it's like I said, it's got its third life. I, it's starting to happen again and people are more ready for it. I just think people weren't ready back then. Do you think that um, just uh, again, this uh, in the social consciousness, I mean, you and I were around when VRML, virtual reality markup language, VRML, was developed at Silicon Graphics a million years ago. And now everybody's, oh, yeah, we can do stuff in 3R and, you know, all of that. Do you think that Facebook renaming themselves Meta, having acquired Oculus for many zeros um, and trying to, I think, brand the metaverse brand them as the comp this is going to be the place is it th that single activity that put this on the radar of of popular culture well we can't underestimate the power of facebook or meta that they've got billions of users um, they had a trillion dollar market cap now it's a half a billion which is still super valuable but that sort of well, that rose the tides. I like to say rising tides lifts all boats. And we've been at this for six years. Right. And that helps rise the tide for everybody because they're putting a lot of money. They, they're spending $10 billion in R&D and just research on headsets and new ways of interacting with computers and just a myriad of things. And so that's going to make it better for everybody do I believe Meta is going to win the game? No, I think the metaverse is going to be, it's like I said, it's the internet, just like everybody has web pages. There'll be all kinds of companies will have destination metaverses sure. and you'll just jump from metaverse to metaverse and Meta will have one, but there'll be a billion others. That's, uh, you know, I, <laughs> that's the, pro that's going to be the problem. I don't know if you remember, of course you remember back in the early days, I'm going to say 1999 when, you know, the web was still early, you could go to the Barnes and Noble member bookstores oh, yeah. and you could buy a directory of all the websites. And uh, like, that was a thing. Um, and there's going to be, I feel like there's this land grab out there for, um, you know, four spaces on this, this virtual real estate where there really isn't anything, but someone's going to figure out how to monetize it. I, as you were talking, I was reminded um, a, a pioneer, an early pioneer, Doug Trumbull, uh, who did um, Space Odyssey, 2001 Space Odyssey, mm -hmm. passed away um, just recently. And I remember meeting him at a conference once, and he was very hot on this new technology, which was a retinal display. Yes. So you could have glasses and it would display on your retina. So you could, again, trying to to break down this barrier so you don't have to have you didn't have to have this 
very heavy display on your face. What do you think? Because I think that's the gating factor is some some way for us to both be in our world, the AR rather than the VR and the virtual world. What are we missing there, Anthony? There's a, <laughs> it's a very... Well, it's a very big question, and there's a lot of things missing. There's, all the elements are there, but the level that is needed aren't there. And so the amount of compute needed to drive those displays in stereo, right? Not just the like, singular displays, oh, sure, 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 in sure, stereo, sure, sure, sure. that's constantly evolving. And thanks to NVIDIA and AMD and even what Apple's doing on the GPU side, that's happening and that's going to get better. You have that. You have display technology, which... Retinal display technology um, still is evolving to have an, enough resolution that you can really have the digital overlay be in, imperceivable from the real world. Like it just looks like it's just fully assimilated with lighting and everything. Um, you have field of view issues on these displays where right yeah. now on these augmented reality displays i don't know if you've tried some of them that's right but yeah. you feel like you're looking through a bit yeah. of a window yeah um and that's getting better but that's got a ways to go um and then just the notion of people putting something on and wearing it that's you know not everybody has glasses in this world and so putting a pair of glasses on may not right. feel feel the best for some people um i do believe that's really interesting coming online are these holographic displays. So I do think of maybe more of a holodeck like experience where you're in a box with all these displays that are creating this world. But again, this is now a full virtual simulation that could be quite amazing. Um, that becomes more uh, important over time. It'll be interesting to see what transpires. I think a lot of the world is waiting to see what Apple does, which is probably still a few years out, but it's going to be very interesting. Anthony, this conversation is amazing. We can, we'll, well, the next one we'll have will be in the metaverse. Yes. 